Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for coming in today. And uh, I suppose last week I spoke about some of the horrors within our uh, <coughs> state care system and the fact that we had 30 deaths last year and seven of them were uh, through suicide. Um, and that is something that makes me very sad to see that uh, our youth and our young people are dying in state care. Um, this is an area I am extremely familiar about. And uh, I'd love to think that everything was all rosy in the garden, but I hate to, to, to tell you all here today that it's far from it. There, there's some excellent um, social care workers out there. Um, some excellent foster, pair work, foster care parents out there. But we need more. We need a lot more. We need probably twice the amount of what we have now. Um, last year, because of COVID, and probably this year as well, they were very limited in actually trying to get parents to foster and trying to get people trained up in fostering. So, and then a lot of parents that, that uh, were on the foster care team um, were reluctant to take children into care because of the COVID as well. So these kids probably ended up in residential care and uh, maybe in maybe the, the, the private, uh, private sector. So that's a real difficulty uh, that we have. So we need, to, we need to find ways around how we can encourage more parents, encourage more people. A single, doesn't matter what demographic you're from, you can still foster a child. If you've got a bed and you've got a home and you're garda vetted and you have, um, you can provide love and support to a child, that's all that child needs. Um, I particularly deal with the teenagers and um, they're probably the, the hardest cohort to, uh, to house because um, people run a mile from them. I don't know why because I find they're probably the most engaging, um, they're the most engaging children that you can get inside your door. Um, they come with the challenges, but certainly once you put them on the right path, um, they, can, uh, they can bring you great joy. And, uh, but I wanted to just, there's a third of the children in Dublin are placed outside the area. Now that's a real concern. The kids cannot um, get a, a foster placement in their own area. Um, they can't continue on their school. They can't continue on, on the things that they found novel, playing in the local clubs and stuff like that. So, that, if we can try and get children to be placed in their own area, that will really, really help. Um, I'm just going to read you a, a testament from a, a young person whom I would know. And she's 21. And she's a full-time uh, student uh, in the aftercare services. And this is her testament. I would like to first of all say that aftercare services have been crucial to me in transitioning to adulthood and I'm forever grateful and I'm for, uh, for the support, funding and care that aftercare has provided me in the last three years. I could not have achieved what I have today without their help. However, there are, in my opinion, a number of deficits in the way that aftercare services currently operate. Firstly, it's important to raise that I am a full-time student. It is that reason that at 21 years of age, I am still supported by the services. Remaining in full-time education is a requirement of such services, as you may be aware. I understand the principle is to keep young people in education. However, this is all, all, often to the detriment of those who choose not to pursue education. Whatever the reason may be, they still need support. It is also personally, uh, to me, a big fear I have. As I mentioned, I'm 21 yet now. I have a degree in law and I'm currently studying to receive my master's degree. I worry that when I finish my master's, what will happen to me? I know this is a worry for many of my friends who are also in aftercare. There are many opportunities I want to pursue after this year, but cannot as they do not meet the criteria of full-time education required by these services. As a result, I am financially constrained and cannot pursue opportunities such as internships, volunteering abroad and more. I understand this may, seem like, uh, it not, may not seem like a serious issue, but I believe this requirement does stop young people reaching their full potential and in most serious cases leaves young people homeless and without financial stability in a, in a matter of weeks after turning 18. Leading on to my second point, I believe that the cut-off age of 23 is too young. I think this could be extended to meet circumstances in each individual case. This requirement, again, means a loss of opportunity for many young people who are still need these vital supports after the age of 23. 
I struggle badly with my mental health, and aftercare has, provide, has provided at time, times which are, aftercare has provided uh, vital support to me. It is the fear that this can be cut off in as little as a year and a half. Many of us young people come into care and need aftercare with a lot of baggage. Many of us have mental health conditions, physical conditions, and need to be continued support. This need does not go away just because we turn a certain age. The age of support needs to be reviewed so that the assessment can be made on an individual case basis. On the topic of precarious state of many young people's mental health, I think that the, another issue that should be flagged is the availability and quality of psychiatric and counselling services that aftercare are in a position to offer a young person. Aftercare provided me with a set of 10 sessions of counselling and I am forever grateful for this. However, it took me to reach a very dangerous place mentally before I was offered this service. Now, the only support I receive is from a university counsellor. Many of us in aftercare cannot afford prices such as 60 or 70 euro an hour to speak to a counsellor when this is almost half of the allowance we receive on a weekly basis to support ourselves for food, transport and otherwise. This is the average price of counselling from her own personal experience and may not be accurate in all cases. I believe that the mental health services need to be improved within the aftercare services. Mental health conditions are, are unfortunate reality that many young people from care face every day. Finally, she says this so many times, she's so grateful for the aftercare service and how compassionate they've been to her over the years. Many of the issues I have flagged are not something that individual uh, aftercare workers have control of or can fix themselves. Um, and there she's thanking, thanking everybody again. But they're just, the, they're just the, the issues that I would face with a lot of children that are in aftercare that would come back to me. There's also, I was on a meeting today with children in poverty, and we were, there were a number of us there today, and they spoke about uh, two, I asked, I asked do, any, do any of the parents ever contact the family support services that are available through Tusla? And they, uh, they said, no way, they'd run a mile. They'd run a mile before they picked the phone up and talked to the Tusla. Now, that has to be our go-to for families when they're in trouble. It really should be our go-to. If families are in trouble, they pick up the phone, that there's somebody there. And that's, well, that's the two slides that I want. That's the, that's the service that I want for our children of this nation. That if children are in trouble, or families are in trouble, and they can see breakdowns happening, that the family support service in Tusla will be there. But parents are afraid to even touch them. They're running a mile from them. So that's a really red flag, Minister. So I really want you to do something about that. Um, I'm sorry, uh, the foster care the service for the 36 children that are coming in. The right thing to do. I'm always uh, uh, mindful of all those that are suffering in the world and, and the refugees that are out there that need our support. I just want to know, is that the, 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 the long term, is that long term or short term for those children that are coming into care? Because, you know, those kids, if they're coming into care, if they're in short term care, you don't want them to be moved around to two or three years later. So I, I would hope that those cases are long, long term uh, care. Um, the residential, the residential placements, sorry, I'm probably taking too long here. Um, the residential uh, placements, the suitable residential placements. Now, I, I was talking to, to Lynn earlier on, I was talking about Lefroy. I, I don't know, they call it Lefroy House. So if a ch child can't get into emergency services, I might have a child, a child through emergency service myself, and I can't take another child. They're then uh, put on to Lefroy House. Now, that Lefroy House is a mix of young teenagers and adults. And those t young teenagers have to be out there at 9 o'clock in the morning. So we really need to have suitable emergency places for uh, children. I'm, so I'm sorry. I'm, I know you're looking at me, and I'm so sorry for oh, taking no, so much time. Because you have such vast personal experience yes, in this area, sorry, Senator, I'm, I'm I, not cutting you off. Um, thank you because you're over time Sorry, and just, I think the minister, the minister would benefit and I know he knows a huge amount in this area, but people like yourselves who have great knowledge, I think it's important that you're able to bring those stories to the minister and say this is what's working and this is what is not working. Um, so I think that's very important.